I, I really, uh, I can't tell you um, how meaningful it has been to get to know all of you, to work with you. And there are a whole bunch of people that aren't here uh, that I feel equally uh, very, very good, great about. And the fact is, is that um, whatever is good, and I hope that these sessions that we uh, have over the uh, succeeding 18 months, two years that uh, this unfolds, that uh, what is really the true uh, efforts that this team put forward uh, comes to light in a way that people recognize what I think as I review it again from perspective, I'm very proud of. And everything that was good that happened was because of the people who uh, worked in the fields for us uh, as a team. And everything that didn't work was my fault. <laughs> and I'm sure I'll get to hear a little of that while we're going through this. And uh, I'll live with it. Maybe I'll complain once in a while and maybe even interrupt. But. Uh, we did some really remarkable things, and I don't think it actually um, has seeded through. But today's discussion are about how we got started, uh, the transition, which was really about people. Uh, we obviously uh, worked our tails off to try to uh, work on agendas in that process. Um, and um, a great, great man who is no longer with us, Dick Leone, uh, deserves a ton of that credit. Heather was pretty helpful in that too, and there were a, a lot of people that worked on it. But it was not just about policy wonking, it was also about making sure we got to the right people. And I think if people are fair and you can just look at where folks are scattered around the world, um, whether they're at Apple or they're commentators on CNN or their uh, justices of Supreme Courts or other role models, teachers and great universities and uh, others. We, we, we had quite a, quite a team and they have contributed uh, well beyond the years and I was definitely the beneficiary of the people work of that transition effort. The second part is something that um, frustrating, uh, but a reality, I, I think, for every governor of New Jersey, is uh, we got a real budget problem here. I think Dick Cody said it right uh, about six months before I came in, and we're pretty much broke. Uh, and I think you could probably repeat that today for Phil, and, uh, and I don't think it's, you know, it's not a partisan issue, the structural challenges that come from uh, managing the finances of this great state because of cumulative uh, judgments and decisions that are taken have left everyone with uh, just a series of not so good choices. And uh, to the unfortunate reality of our administration, my administration, we also uh, ended up with the worst recession since the Great Depression, which turned what was already a difficult and challenging environment with regard to finances into uh, well, almost an impossible dream. But we, uh, we all face that with an integrity that I am very proud of. And if you go back and look at the numbers and the kinds of things we did, and you'll, we'll speak about them uh, as we go through these various sessions. Um, but there were, there were real efforts to try to address uh, the challenges that came. Some of our biggest uh, successes were in the area of how we manage the finances of the state. And some of the biggest uh, shortfalls came from um, maybe my inability as a politician to be able to sell an idea that might have righted the, the, uh, the ship with regard to our finances and our capacity to do the things that I think the people of this state work. I'm going to stop there, but I do want to just, I want to, I went back and read my inaugural dress. I was having trouble sleeping, so I thought it was a good idea that I do this. But there were a couple of things that I do want to point out. 
And one is that, and I think that was the spirit of everyone, I called on myself and all the other people to dedicate ourselves to a spirit of service and for a belief in impartiality and how we uh, carried forth our efforts, that our goal was to serve the people of New Jersey, not individual interests. Um, and I believe all of you did that, and I certainly hope you believed I tried. Um, I also think that um, I outlined a pretty clear agenda, and one we'll get to talk a little bit about here today. Uh, I'm just going to read you a paragraph. Today's courts govern the funding of our schools, the management of our child welfare system, our housing and borrowing policies, and oversight of the management of our state law enforcement. Um, our U.S. Attorney has stepped into a governance of a role of our state medical school, and our state is being sued to fulfill its financial obligations for public employees. That was what we inherited. Uh, <laughs> And that was real. We were under federal monitors damn near on every aspect of how we were governing at the time we came. And there was, in addition to that, you know, whether it was $3 billion or $5 billion, and I don't leave it at anybody's doorstep, that big a hole that you had to fix based on how we got started. So um, when Brad and all of the folks that were involved in the finances sat down on day one to try to uh, say, uh, how are we going to get a handle on all this? You have to put it into this kind of context. And I think we did some pretty doggone good things as we went through it. And I'll hopefully get a chance to single some of those out as we go through um, these discussions. But let me go back to just saying um, it was an honor for me to be able to be your colleague uh, in this process, most of the people here. And I actually uh, have, have a great respect for the press and their role in making sure that those of us who do serve are properly challenged. And if we need to see that, you, need us, you can turn on any television station or <laughs> read any newspaper, uh, there is a role for uh, the, the estate. And uh, I'm grateful for all of you being here and how you contributed to the dialogue as we go forward. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, I am honored that Eagleton has uh, taken this task on. Chris has done a pretty doggone good job of putting together a timeline. And John, you were patient with me. Who, didn't always return phone calls in a timely fashion. And I, I have to say, um, this is a great project that they're taking on. I think there's a lot to learn. Um, last comment, single best job I've ever had in my life is being the governor of the state of New Jersey. Loved it. And uh, we'll go to my grave. Uh, grateful to the people of New Jersey for giving me a chance to serve. Thank you. So as you'll see on the program, the afternoon is divided in three. There is two pan will be two panels after which there's a reception. We hope you can all stay for as much of that as possible. And we'll start this panel with Heather Howard. Thank you, John, and thank you, Governor Corzon. I know I speak for everyone here um, in thanking you for your service, and we're really excited to be here today to, to, to start to reflect on your legacy. And we have a great panel today of folks, but I will start by saying we are, as you noted, hampered by not having some dear friends here. And of course, you mentioned Dick Leon, who chaired your transition, and we all mourned his passing. Um, there are other folks we wish could be here today with us who couldn't. Uh, Maggie Moran played such a critical role in the transition. So um, uh, Stu Rabner and Ed McBride, now sitting on the bench, can't be here. So um, uh, Matt is going to, I'm sure, ably step into those shoes. Um, but those are quite shoes to step into. Um, so we're actually hoping that you'll help us crowdsource some of this because we don't have everybody. So we know this is not a shy crowd. And so we hope you'll speak up. And um, if we get something wrong, if we forget something, and this nothing is that I talked to John Weingart about this before. This is, we just have the start. This is the start. And we hope people will help fill in. So what, what we want to do in our time here briefly is talk about how the campaign 
informed the transition and the setting up of the governor's office. And so I'm gonna start with Tom on that. And then Carl, we're gonna lean heavily on, uh, who was vice chair of the transition, is gonna talk about the transition and the setting up of the governor's office. And then of course, one big theme in, if you go back and look at Governor Corzine's um, inaugural address was ethics and setting the tone. And so Matt's gonna talk about that. And then there was a lot of rethinking what government was gonna look like. And of course, that included setting up the public advocate. So we're gonna hear from Ron about that. Um, and then maybe plant some seeds for the second panel and future discussions that we're gonna have. So that makes it sound more formal, I think, than it's gonna be. But Tom, can I call on you first to talk about that transition? Shh. How the campaign and the, right? Sure. <laughs> and there was sure. a Senate pick in there too, right? I mean, a yes. Senate selection. Um, I, you know, if I might, Heather, what I'd like to do is start by maybe just reminding us all and do a little bit of a scene setting um, about the environment um, in which Governor Corzine took office. And this, I think, um, will um, be a good preface, not just for this um, panel, but if, if I might take the liberty of using some of our time to prepare for my panel <laughs> later on. Uh, but I think, I think it's relevant because um, because I think the same things um, that um, informed choices we made in the transition also ultimately informed what the first um, Corzine budget looked like. Um, and so a lot of that was both at least viewed on our part as an antidote to the political climate in the state at the time, um, as well as um, an expression of the ideas that we talked about during the campaign, but probably more importantly, the, the biography um, of the governor and the unique skills um, that we promised the people of New Jersey he would bring to the task of governing the state. And so if you remember in, first of all, in, in 2005, we were running then for governor to succeed, essentially, with the exception of Dick Cody's interim period as acting governor. So we were we were running to succeed a governor who had resigned um, amid amidst a bit of a scandal, um, and I think he was also a governor who at the time was viewed as very much a part of the Trenton culture and the Trenton establishment, um, and so. We were very cognizant of positioning Governor Corzine, then Senator Corzine, as something very different from that. Um, there were a series of, I don't want to say scandals, but there was, a, there was clearly an awareness of a culture in Trenton of folks who might have made decisions that were in their interests first rather than in, in the interests of the people, whether it was um, office holders who held multiple jobs and use those multiple jobs to gain multiple pensions, um, whether it was earmarks for pet projects um, for members of the legislature, for organizations in which they were intimately involved, um, you know, resignations for one reason or another. So, so there, there, was, there, was, there was clearly, I think, a sense, and I think it was probably really brought to um, greater public um, interest because of the McGreevy resignation. Um, but there, there really was this sense of this sort of culture of corruption in Trenton. And we really, throughout the course of the campaign in 2005, were trying to position um, Governor Corzine or Senator Corzine as, as somebody you know different and not from that world. Having said that, I would also say um, that particularly for those who are still involved now and know what the State House press corps looks like in 2017, the difference between now and then it, it, um, is extraordinary. I mean, the, the, the shrinking of the press corps had begun. Um, the reorganization of that business had begun, certainly, by 2005. But there was still a very robust um, State House press corps. Um, you know, there are several members of the State House Bureau of the Star Ledger who are there with us today, all with their all with their new Pulitzer Prizes in their pockets and all looking for the next one. <laughs> um, and so there was a very, very, um, I think, aggressive posture 
um, of the press, both in terms of their reporting and in terms of the point of view of the editorials, which also shaped, I think, how we were all thinking about how decisions would be perceived um, and processed through the media for the public. So th I think all of those things, particularly as it relates to some of the early decisions we made in the transition around ethics, um, the decision to appoint a federal prosecutor as the governor's chief counsel, I mean, I think there were a couple of things we did very early on um, that were reflective of the kinds of things we promised to do during the campaign and were in some ways reactive to that, that culture that I just talked about that I think really, really shocked a lot of people in Trenton. I think Stuart Radner's appointment certainly did. Um, I think some of the ethics rules and financial disclosure rules that we, that we um, opened the administration with caught people's attention. And so um, I think, at least in that respect, I think we were able to do, at the, at, the, in, in, at the onset of the administration, the beginning of the transition, to send the signal that we had intended to send through some of those very early uh, moves. And Carl, did, do you want to pick up on that thread of, you know, in terms of approaching the transition and approaching the cabinet picks and sure. setting policy agenda? First of all, I just want to say nice to be at a high school reunion when everyone doesn't look all that much different than they did 12 years ago. <laughs> uh, I also want to apologize to the governor for not wearing my sweater vest. Um, a story that he may or may not recall, but one time I showed up on a campus, he was giving a speech, and these students came running over to me and said, Senator Corzine, Senator Corzine. <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> so I stopped wearing the sweater vest after that. But um, I want to pick up on a couple things Tom said. Um, first of all, uh, I went back and looked at, believe it or not, I have these in my computer, the governor's policy commitments during the campaign. And the first 12 items on here say ethics. The first speech he gave during the campaign to a large audience at the Boston School was about ethics. And we worked a lot, uh, spent a lot of time on that because of the atmosphere that Tom talked about. Uh, and when we set up the transition, we had a whole different idea about who should be involved. For example, no legislators, no lobbyists, nobody with uh, obvious conflicts of interest, which again, as we were giving these speeches, I'm sure many people in this room said to us, you didn't really mean that, did you? <laughs> You're kidding. That was just to get elected. Well, he did mean it, and we tried to carry it forward as best we could. Um, so clearly, um, and this is, of course, a Democrat succeeding a Democrat, right? So this is not a situation where you're blaming the other tribe, which is pretty easy to do, right? We're enjoying that right now in the Murphy administration. <laughs> so um, it was a, a fraught, difficult time, I think, for Trenton. And I also read, went back and read the, the governor's inaugural speech. And I, in the first, I think, three paragraphs, the central theme is about public integrity, right? Over and over again, the legislators were sitting behind him in disbelief and agony, <laughs> I'd say, it's fair to say. Um, so, uh, but that wasn't the only thing. So the other, the other parts of it which have been mentioned, I think, it clearly was to establish some fiscal sanity as best we could. And then part of the other part of that equation, of course, is you've got to raise more money by growing the economy, right? So there was a, a whole strategy around economic growth. And um, so as we set up the, these policy committees, we, we had this wonderful acronym. They're called PMAGs, <laughs> Policy Management Advisory Groups. Um, and they were small. Uh, contrast this with uh, Governor Murphy's, which were 500. Uh, this was more like 50 people or so total. Um, and um, the specific instructions they were given, which I have here, was the PMAGs will examine how to implement candidate Corzine's core agenda, not create a new one. Right? So this really reflected the fact that the campaign was very policy heavy. Right? It had an excellent policy staff, uh, Monica Le Maurice, Ed McBride, Curtis Fisher, Allison Kabicki. These are people, I had something to do with that too, but these were people who were 
deeply enmeshed in the details of policy and worked very closely with the team and with the governor. He gave, an, a senator, he gave a number of speeches during that period. So there was a clear agenda laid out during the campaign, and the idea was to carry that forward, right? Um, and so, and, and, and also, it was designed as a roadmap for who we should be selecting to run these departments. Uh, and, and the governor brought with him um, his experience from Goldman, which was to have a very thorough vetting process, right? And so we put together panels of folks who were not going to serve in government or didn't want a position. Uh, so it was not like Dick Cheney that, you know, they, he, he found himself to be the best candidate uh, for vice president. So they, they reviewed, and then usually after they'd gone through that process, they would, uh, they would be interviewed by the, the governor-elect. So because of that process, I, I would say, it is fair to say, I think, as the, as the governor said, we did come up with some very, you did come up with some very excellent people, but it also meant it took a long time. Right, because uh, the vetting process can be done quickly and you know, it doesn't take much, or if you do it carefully, um, it takes longer. And back then, the best we could do for vetting was a Google search, which was sort of new. I remember suggesting that to somebody, and they said, what, you know, what are we gonna find out? I said, well, at least we'll find out if they're convicted of some crime that's been in the paper. Um, so we tried to do that, but I think the vetting was more by the folks that were on those, those committees. Um, and uh, the governor, the then governor-elect, interviewed a lot of people that went through that process. I can't remember more than a couple of cases where we weren't five or six deep into the process until he was comfortable with, with the person to nominate them uh, for the position. Um, the other point I want to touch on is the, the uh, economic growth issue. Um, during the campaign, I had suggested a restructuring of government that we needed uh, a person who would be in charge of economic growth and to create an office within the uh, governor's office called the Office of Economic Growth. And I take pride in that because it was the first office Governor Christie eliminated when he was elected. <laughs> so that meant you did something absolutely right. Um, <laughs> candidate Corzine then, so okay, Van Horn, um, you find a person to run it. Um, and fortunately, um, I found Gary Rose, who is here today, I think. I don't know where you are, Gary. Yeah, right here. There he is. And he was very expensive. Uh, <laughs> buck a year. Um, and uh, he put together a staff, an excellent staff, um, terrific staff, that um, developed a strategic plan for the state, um, which, again, I think was carried through in many dimensions and only interrupted by the worst recession in 70 years. But that team then being in place was able to pivot and take action during that crisis. So I think actually it turned out to be a really, a really good thing. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, I've tried to tell the truth and no innocent lies, uh, but I think it was a, a very successful period and had we not had the worst recession in 70 years, um, it would have been a very different story. Well, let me, let me interject one, one element. Uh, you know, we also had an advantage that a lot of folks didn't have. Uh, one of those advantages is the lady to your right, but I was able to bring yes. uh, I, maybe a dozen folks out of the Senate staff who both knew me, um, and also, I knew where their strengths were. Uh, and they made a huge difference yeah. in the campaign and supplying uh, the intellectual framework for the idiot to go out and talk on the stump. <laughs> and, and, and to actually help bring strong framework to how we worked with people who were uh, here in the state, yourself and Dick particular, but I, I, I think it would be remiss to not to say that transition was aided enormously by the, the great work that we had from people who had already been involved. With, and I think uh, I'll just add in that too, that the through line is these are issues you've been working on and this is going to be a little bit more unusual for you writing the history of a governor who had been a senator. 
Mm -hmm. You had your first bill in the Senate had been to ban racial profiling. So you were coming into government, having been working on those issues, um, you know, for years. So that's something for us to keep in mind is the, the seeds that had been planted in the Senate. So I'll turn to you, Matt. Um, Tom talked about the ethics and the new climate and appointing a federal prosecutor as chief counsel. Um, and that it wasn't the selection of you came in to work under Stuart Rabner and to head the authorities unit where there was a big focus on ethics. And then the first executive order, which many people here in the cabinet may remember, required significant disclosure, financial disclosures, um, more so than, than ever. And Jose tells me that NGA says it was the most uh, aggressive financial disclosure and it's still in place, right? So, so executive order one, the work of the authorities unit, can you tell us what that was like? And yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, first off, I feel compelled to note that the ethics measures that we put in place were so tight that Stu Radner can't be here today. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and now here I am, you know, trying to pinch hit for the chief justice of the uh, Supreme Court of the state of New Jersey. Um, but that, that slight irony aside, um, uh, 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 yeah, let me, let me note a few things regarding ethics and then some of the substantive, very substantive outgrowths of the governor's uh, ethics initiatives. You mentioned Executive Order One. Um, it sent a significant message to the state in that the very first thing that the, that the governor did by executive order was an ethics measure and telling all of the members of his staff as well as the members of the state authorities throughout the state who had not been subject to these these kinds of requirements that the state was entitled to know what kind of uh, financial commitments to third parties that they held and how that may be affecting the work that they were conducting on, on behalf of the people of the state. Um, Tom mentioned, and I think it's a point that really cannot be overstated, was the appointment of Stuart Rabner, a federal prosecutor, as the governor's chief counsel, really, and I wasn't as close to the politics, obviously, as Tom was at the time, but from what I saw, really shook the political landscape in Trenton. Um, I think, yeah. Matt, sorry, I, I don't yeah. want to interrupt too much, but I think, I think it is safe to say, actually, that there were some people in, within the State House who were absolutely terrified when they heard that Stuart Rabner was going to become the governor's chief counsel. I also think um, that there was a similar reaction amongst lots of government contractors, <laughs> um, board members, and employees within each of the independent authorities of the state government when it was announced that Matt Boxer, also a former federal prosecutor, was going to be the first um, head of the governor's authorities unit within the council's office. So I think the, the combination of those two appointments, I think, was, was very um, unsettling to a lot of people within the political establishment, both inside of Trenton and around the state at all of the independent authorities. So, sorry, Matt. Yeah, no, no, please, uh, please interject and in folks in the, you know, in the room also. Um, yeah, I think, you know, f it took us a, f a few months just to convince folks that we weren't there to hand out subpoenas and, you know, wear a wire and take <laughs> folks. And it, I mean, it sounds funny, but that is very much what people were thinking at that time. And perhaps and, deserve to think. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I still have all the tapes that I made. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, you know, it, it, it did take a few months to give people, you know, a sense and a comfort that we were there to govern, first and foremost. Um, w the authorities unit specifically was an area that I think had, um, really, there's really a sea change based on the governor's push that started in the, in the campaign long before I was ever involved um, for, to, to shine a light on what the governor correctly recognized was the hidden government in New Jersey. You know, the, their, as the governor mentioned, the, the state government had no money at that time. The state authorities did. 
That's where all the money was being spent. And nobody had any idea what was going on there until John Corzine became governor and said, you know what, we're going to shine a light on this. We're going to give people a sense of what's going on at these state authorities and how this is working. Um, the, you know, I, I, I remember the, some of the, the early weeks I had in that job where, um, where I would get calls from the state authorities. That time it's not my phone, so you can't all look at me. It's somebody else's phone this time. Uh, <laughs> um, I would get calls early on from the state authorities, you know, and, and remember, I'm, you know, I'm a senior staffer in the governor's office. I get a call saying, who do you want us to hire to be our engineer? Who do you want us to hire to be our, our lawyer? You know, the, in the past there was a list. You guys would go down the list as to, you know, who would be the, whoever had most favored nation status, and you, you know, you'd let us know. And, you know, um, from John Corzine to Stu Rabner on down, you know, we were all adamant, we're not doing that anymore. And, um, and, and that really was a, um, a sea change in the, way that, uh, in, in the way that things had been run. And just, and UMDNJ was a big focus early on too, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that was another, I mean, as, as I recall the issues, as we sort of move from campaign mode and transition mode to governing mode, and I think the, the feeling, as I recall, on day one or so was UMDNJ was probably the first issue that needed to be dealt with on a very uh, near-term, emergent, really, basis that needed to be handled right to give the folks in, of the state confidence that we knew what we were doing and, and, and that we could handle these things effectively. You know, as, uh, as you know, like Tom was saying before, in terms of setting the stage, the U.S. Attorney's Office had, m shortly before we came to Trenton, had marched into a meeting at UMDNJ and said, y you guys are gonna appoint a federal monitor or you're gonna be indicted. And as a result, there was a monitor appointed, and um, you know, Josh and you know, and, and others from the media were um, you know were finding and and reporting about a steady stream of of issues there um, a, as we were coming on board, and the the folks who were there overseeing all that. We're still there on day one of Governor Corzine's administration, and that's something that had to be dealt with, had to be dealt with quickly, and it, and it was. And, and it wasn't too, too far into the administration that, uh, that the monitor was then, um, you know, was, was, then came to an end. But those, those UMDNJ personnel issues were, were something that had to be dealt with quickly, and the, 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 the president of the university was, there was a, a severance package that was negotiated, he was moved out. And Bob Del Tufo, a former New Jersey Attorney General, was made chair of the UMDNJ board, all in an effort to, to, get, the, to get the ship righted there. Um, so then another focus, as was mentioned, was this rethinking government. And um, we know Governor Corzine came in with many progressive ideas. And one of those ideas was really implementing the standing up the office of office of the public advocate right ron is my getting that department right? department of public advocate department. um and and also finding this this i think this thread about finding um getting outside of trenton and finding people um for cabinet positions and and picking an academic was an interesting choice and um in i think we try to do sorry ron I, before i let you talk but we try to do that in a number of different yep. ways and one of um you know, I seem to recall um, that during the campaign, I mean, now it would seem very quaint, but we had something called the Corzine Connection, which was sort of a grassroots that Blair McInnes was very involved with during the campaign. Um, and we tried to use that network to bring people into the process who might not otherwise um, have sought out jobs in Trenton um, or, or have been considered by previous administrations. And we also established um, during the transition an online portal where you could, where any citizen of the state could apply for a job. And we actually found Greg Paw, who became the director of the Division of Criminal Justice within the, within the Attorney General's office, within the Department of um, uh, Law and Public Safety, um, through that process. He had been a, a, a former federal prosecutor. He could be involved with the, um, with the federal military uh, in prosecutions related to the Iraq war, as I recall, the first one. Um, and we actually, his, his resume came in over the transom. 
um, and he wound up being the head of the Division of Criminal Justice. Again, another one of those decisions that probably was really unsettling to a lot of people. <laughs> um, but um, so we did try to come up with some unique ways to get people who otherwise would not have been involved in government and politics in New Jersey and public service um, to, to give them an opportunity to be considered for some of these positions, um, as well as, Heather said, um, reaching out and bringing in um, you know, folks from academia to, to head some of these um, departments as well. So something that was really exciting, as Tom said, was, was bringing you in, Ron, and standing back up the public advocate. Can you tell us about that? Well, first, it's great to see everyone again, uh, all these smiling faces. I wonder if I, would, if I were to describe to you the expression that many of you had when you first met me 12 years ago. Uh, it was a little different, uh, and I mean this nicely. It wasn't me personally. Most of you did, had never met me before in my life, but it was because there had not been a Department of the Public Advocate in 12 years. Uh, you might meet other people, uh, the, the, uh, the designated secretary, uh, commissioner of transportation, or, but you at least knew what the Department of the Transportation did and there were certain ways in which parts of state government could relate to each other. But you didn't have that with the Department of the Public Advocate. So uh, I had sort of uh, three or four objectives um, uh, coming in. I will admit one is that I wanted to make sure I didn't disgrace myself and be thrown out of Trenton within six months as was occasionally predicted by some of my uh, har harsher critics. I, I, accomplished, <laughs> uh, I accomplished that. Then, obviously, there is the, just the mechanics of building up a principal department, what at least in theory is a principal department of state government, limited to 20 under the state constitution, uh, that, ha that had not existed for 13 years. Uh, so, uh, I, I mean, I have, having come from and, of course, returned to an institution of some complexity, uh, such as Rutgers, uh, had some experience with this, but we all know that Trenton has certain ways of doing things, certain language that I'll admit took me a while just to understand, in but not of, what is in but not of? Um, everyone's telling me, you have a division administration, where's your division administration? Everyone else has a division administration. I, when I said, I don't really think I need a division of administration, it was like I was um, declaring some heresy, although I think it was the first time that a, a principal department went without a division, and the Department of the Treasury, Brad Avalo and I signed a, a, some agreement which, which is considered revolutionary. The, 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 but the, uh, I, mean, I was pretty mindful of the fact that the Department of the Public Advocate, uh, while it had a long history in, in New Jersey, had not been in people's minds for quite some time. You may remember, in theory, the Public Advocate in New Jersey, the statute then, now, and again, and maybe who knows in the future, um, uh, created a very unique entity, uh, someone who actually had the power to sue his boss. Every so often I would think of this Captain Chen versus Corzine. <laughs> <laughs> but which to his credit, the governor said, if you think that's what you have to do, do it. I don't think he would have been pleased. Uh, <laughs> right. um, but um, uh, but uh, he was always very respectful. He's in, 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 uh, of the role that the public advocate was supposed to play. Other than, as the government noted, the other thing I was trying to think of is that, of, with the obvious uh, other exception of the attorney general, the public advocate is, by definition, the one lawyer on the cabinet, although there are others of you who were lawyers. It was, by definition, that was part of the job, and sort of part of the role to define how the legal system and public policy interact to each other. As the governor said in his opening remarks, New Jersey has a history in that regard. Um, and not all of it always welcomed by all quarters. So I could, I could sense, oh my, what is he going to do? Is he going to charge up on affordable housing and school funding and maybe throw in a little Megan's Law to boot? And then I would have lasted six months. On the other hand, obviously, I wasn't interested in developing being the best public advocate about the law of flower arrangements. So I wanted to pick something that was uh, meaningful, impactful, at least and I'll say this in all candor, I, w I had a, a le perhaps enough residual political savvy that I was, in the, fir in the first term, I was planning, relying upon what I think all of us were relying on, which was the possibility of a second term. So I didn't think it was necessary to charge up San Juan Hill uh, with a lot of the issues that, uh, frankly, might have, might have, uh, I might have undertaken Later on, one of them I eventually did at the governor's best, which is the policy on um, uh, immigration, 
and immigrants' policies, which to this day I, I, I play a part in in, 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 my, in my new role, in my, in my later role. Uh, the initial one that I took on, you may remember, because it sort of hit the correct balance between something that was on people's minds, but perhaps didn't think that I was going to try to take down the entire system, was the use of eminent domain for, uh, for redevelopment. <clears throat> so I put my academic skills to use, came up with state constitutional law arguments before the state Supreme Court, and it really worked. Uh, there are members of the redevelopment bar who I meet to this day who sort of who blame me for the economic downturn. I, I don't think I can take credit for that. <laughs> but the fact that redevelopment uh, slowed, which was to uh, do a lot of other things, but, but because uh, the public advocate took that one, that, uh, that issue on, um, uh, and it had, had some immediate effect. The other things that we took on, some of it was random because they were thrust upon me. We had the, the, uh, the public advocate had the division of rate council I, I'll tell you, going and I knew nothing about utility law rate making, but that meant that I had to deal with the proposed uh, merger of uh, acquisition by Exelon of PSE and G. Uh, Ralph is was not here today, but it, and so we, we, we played a role in that, and I was trying to sound very knowledgeable and confident, but I will tell you about something that I knew absolutely, at least initially, nothing, but reached a result, actually. Um, so as you may remember, Exelon did not acquire a PSENG, and there were all the all the uh, progressive organizations were actually commending the governor um, of various policy people and the public advocate for causing uh, that result to occur. Uh, the other issues that I uh, thought of, I picked up what I thought were a few quote safe issues: uh, childhood lead poisoning. Who could be in favor of it? But you, you, there's always there's always something about about what it's going to cost. And there, of course, like all of us, uh, I, the public advocate, no less, always had to worry because of the state budgetary crunch. You, you can advocate for all sorts of things, but the minute it costs more than a few cents, uh, then there are, there are some obvious uh, political implications. And probably where I had the most interaction with you all, it was something which everyone agreed was a great idea, but who's going to pay for it? Uh, so I, I obviously, I received a huge education myself. It, those of you in this room who are interacting with all will, will laugh at the fact that now that I'm back here at Rutgers, back in academia, they consider me to be like a political insider, <laughs> sa savvy. Uh, uh, hopefully, I'm, I, I'm somewhat in between. But I, I view my experience in Trenton as, as a highlight of my career um, and uh, really taught me the, the way this state works, sometimes the way the state doesn't work. Thanks, Ron. And just while we're on this sort of idea of reshaping government, um, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that also in that first year, Governor, you created the Department of Children and Families. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier in the face of get, getting us out of the, um, the litigation and the court monitoring of our child welfare system. Also, one of your early executive orders was created the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. Um, by March, you had done that, and you brought together the, the emergency preparedness and the Homeland Security and the, the counterintelligence work. And in the theme of picking, Tom, I think the outsiders, Dick Conyas, who came from the DEA, and wasn't he also maybe a spook? I don't know. Was he CIA? There was always that. <laughs> We're not allowed to say. It, yeah, he was. Not allowed to say. Not allowed to say. Okay. But he... Um, he, uh, he had some interesting holes on his resume, right, where he'd been doing <laughs> some interesting things. Um, so you brought in Dick Conyas, and of course, I want to mention Jane Oates was another one of the, the non-traditional people who we in, in pulled up to Trenton. Um, so, so those are sort of structurally, I think we want to remember to think about the creating the new departments and restructuring. Do you, you want to say something about that? Or? Well, I think that the, the unique challenge that we had as an administration is we were all ambitious on a social justice, uh, improve the lives of all New Jerseyans, not just those that are doing well, in an environment where we didn't have two nickels to rub together and we needed to be able to organize in a way that was more focused on that. And so that tension went on not just in the transition thought process, but it was an everyday reality. I, I, I'm 
listening to Ron talk, I remember the first three months he was there, he couldn't get an office. And he couldn't get a secretary. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy was being asked to do unbelievable stuff. I thought he was going to sue me. <laughs> How the hell am I supposed to do this job? I got no people, no office. And it was actually, and I, I don't know, it was probably Brad that wasn't giving him any resources. I can't know. But the, uh, the reality is those tensions that we had right from the start, um, and, I, and, I, and it wasn't because people were angry with each other. We just, we had limited tools to deal with a lot of the agenda that we wanted. And we needed to make sure that uh, they rationalized. And so uh, I think you heard a great presentation of how we came out of the, um, the transition. But I'm going to go back to, you know, I just look at the people that are sitting on that dais. And I feel really good about our administration and how they, ours, not mine, ours, how we put the right people in right spots to get a lot of great things done. And this is indicative of it. You know, I would say, too, um, Heather, one of the threads that runs through the conversation, and we might have sort of touched on it, but I, I just want to say it more pointedly, is that um, both in terms of what we talked about in the campaign and how we approached the uh, governing once in office and the thinking behind what Matt talked about when he called around to the authorities unit and they were all being expected to they were all expecting to be giving a directive about who would be the law firms, who would get the bond work, um, which PR firms were you allowed to hire, you know, and, and, and they were told that that wasn't something we were going to get in or whether it was, you know, with Ron, as Ron alluded to, um, you know, not being directed by the governor's office as to which cases he was to pursue. I think all of that, the common thread about that, that defined our approach, at least as we saw it, is that we were we were very um, we were very cognizant of the decisions that we made not being viewed as business as usual or the way things had historically been done in Trenton, and we were very conscious of creating processes and making decisions that that were made on the merits rather than on the politics, uh, and particularly, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but particularly um, that was the case where we were talking about the expenditure of, of taxpayer dollars, whether it was through the government itself or through um, ratepayers or, you know, um, um, at, at one of the independent authorities, that so we were very cognizant that we were going to create merit-based um, systems and processes for making those decisions, particularly as it related to the expenditure of monies. Well, speaking of that, though, Tom, didn't did remind me, didn't we also, didn't the governor agree to cut the size of the governor's office? Yes. <laughs> Maybe we ought to mention that. <laughs> if, if, if as if as John said earlier, being being governor is the best job in politics, I would posit that being chief of staff to a governor is considerably lower on the ranking. <laughs> do you, but do you want to comment on on how you how you structured the governor's office? I think that because interestingly, it was this this three deputy chiefs of staff, which we now know and is the the norm. And I'm looking at one one well, only one is here in the room now. I Patty. Known this, I would have never taken <laughs> um, it's the norm now, but it wasn't the norm then. And I think you set that up. Uh, you know, do you want to talk a little bit of how you approached setting up? I, I you know, I, I have to think back. I think um, Jose remembers. We were talking about you set up cabinet affairs, reflecting some of your experience at the federal level. We did. I, you know, I, I'm trying to think back. I remember spending a lot of time during the transition. First of all, what we haven't touched on which aside from setting up the government, we spent a lot of time thinking about um, and deliberating about was that when, when um, Governor Corzine was elected, he was then faced with um, the task of appointing somebody to fill his seat in the United States Senate on the day he was sworn in as governor. Um, and so I recall spending a lot of time thinking about that and worrying about that. Um, and then um, some initial time recruiting some people who we wanted. So I, I you know, I, I seem to recall that for for whatever reason, and my anybody can can correct me if my recollection is not correct, but I feel like 
bringing in Janine LaRue as one of the deputy chiefs of staff was really a byproduct of the Corzine connection and that outreach mm -hmm. work. And we wanted somebody in a very senior role within the front office who was going to be able to do that, continue that kind of outreach beyond the usual suspects in politics. Um, so I, I do recall, I think at that point, there may have historically only been two deputy chiefs in the front office. I'm not, sh I'm not sure what Cody had done or what um, McGreevy had done. I know, um, I know Governor Florio only had two, and I, and I believe that was also the case for Governor Whitman, but I'm not sure. Um, but, but we were very conscious about um, the, the need to have a, a senior person in the front office who was, was going to be focused more on things outside of Trenton. Um, and then, of course, one, uh, because, because the governor had not been in Trenton before, then we obviously wanted uh, you know, somebody like Patty McGuire, who was going to be very focused on the legislature. Again, not as, a, just not as a director of legislative affairs, but as a deputy chief of staff. Um, in the governor's office, so I, I, I do think we spent some time thinking about the structure, and we and we changed it um, based on what the, you know, those priorities were at the time. Carl, you're a veteran of a number of transitions. Any other, you know, what haven't we talked about that we should hit on? I am a veteran. I used to be six foot five. Now I'm uh, <laughs> five foot ten. Um, well, they're all different, but I, I think uh, Tom said at the beginning. I think it's always context specific and whoever's the governor, and, and they, it uh, reflects their point of view. Um, I think it is it absolutely was in our mind that we wanted to leverage the, the governor-elect's uh, terrific experience in the business community so that we could uh, and then build a staff around that. Um, you know, one of the things that we haven't mentioned is that um, where I think the uh, Governor Corzine was prescient was in focusing on urban revitalization, not just rhetorically, but also in policy terms. So uh, in the very beginning of the administration, uh, we started focusing on that and uh, building a strategic plan around that. And then, uh, of course, the, with the help of the legislature, passed a urban hub tax credit program that, that Gary was very involved in to develop transit-oriented um, opportunities. Um, and to this day, I mean, it was expanded somewhat towards the end of uh, his term, but to this day, it, you can see the results of that all over the state. Uh, here in New Brunswick, uh, where I spend most of my time, uh, all around the train station, you see huge development, all brought about by um, incentives of the right kind. Um, and I, I should also mention that um, just while I've got the floor, when I, I was the chair of the Economic Development Authority, and um, the first meeting, a reporter came up to me afterward and said, which of these that you just approved uh, are campaign contributors to Governor Corzine? And I said to him, I have no effing idea, <laughs> and I don't care. And I understand why you're asking that question, but I don't expect you'll ever have to ask that question to me again. And during the time when I was uh, working uh, for the governor, there wasn't a single time when he ever asked me to do anything with respect to those decisions uh, or chided me for making the wrong decision. Because when he interviewed for me the job, he said, do what you and your professional colleagues thinks is best. Carl, can I, can I interrupt you for one second? Because I, you, you know, called this, me, if I can remember this story. <laughs> <laughs> that never happened. <laughs> Fake news. Fake news. <laughs> Um, and I don't know if he's going to remember, but, and I don't remember the details, but I know it was a decision that we were making in the governor's office that had political implications, but we were actually having a conversation, the governor and I and, and somebody else, and we were having sort of a very thoughtful, substantive conversation about how we should make this decision. And at some point in this conversation, I... I butt dialed Josh Margolin, who got a voicemail with this entire conversation on. Do you remember this? I don't remember what the I don't remember what the subject was. Maggie's voice is really the only one that was discernible. I, I couldn't hear the governor's, and you only weighed in at some point. That went dead. So I use that as a chit to get a better story. But it, it seemed like it was very high-minded for them. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it was not a setup at all. <laughs> so, your voice the next morning didn't sound good. I always knew there was something going on. There. <laughs> Sorry, Carl. <laughs> Heather, I, I do want to make one other, two observations, if I can remember the second one. The first one, though, is in the transition, one of the things that was absolutely um, repeated, and I'm not trying to say this, although Ruth will, I think, attest to this. We wanted to get a very diverse cabinet. Um, and we wanted to get women into positions of authority and, and, and on merit, not on, not on an, any other basis than in the same way we felt about ethics, we felt like we had to open up the, the uh, avenues of opportunity for people. And that was something that uh, I, I think, Carl, you knew that if you came with a list of people that uh, were all white males with sweater vests and beards, <laughs> they were probably not going to work uh, as we went forward. The other thing is, is that um, I think there was um, a desire also to make sure um, that people were were going to be reasonable teammates with each other. We, you know, it's it's hard enough to govern when you have a um, um, different branches of government that have different routines. And I remember having this conversation with Dick Leone regularly. We got to, you know, maybe I'm not the best at this. Maybe you are. Maybe we'll have to work on it. I know Tom and I had this. We've got to get the chemistry of this right because uh, this, is, this is a marathon. It is not always going to be pleasant. We found that out real fast. Uh, but that there was a lot of challenges. You don't have the chemistry of the people right. And then as opposed to my experience where you grow up in an organization, you work there for 20 years, and you know the people that don't have right chemistry somehow seem to fade, here you're putting everything together at once. We didn't do that perfectly, but we were attendant to that. And we were, I think, and I'm proud to see that uh, Governor Murphy has taken this even a step further. I think there is a real attention to making sure that the administration looks like the people that we are trying to serve. Do you want, Matt, do you want to say something on that? Yeah, uh, w one, other, um, w one other issue that we, that we haven't touched on that I think is an important one, and, and I can work in my other former job, uh, is that a thrust, w one of the, the topics that was really a thrust of the governor's campaign was creating an office of the state comptroller. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I wouldn't want the, to end the session here today without referring to that. Um, and a after, the, um, after the election, obviously, the, the governor succeeded on, um, on creating the office and, and standing it up. Um, the, I think one of the important recognitions um, uh, uh, of the governors that was reflected there was that a, a large percentage of expenditures in the state happen at the local government level. And there, historically, there really hadn't been, from the state itself, any concerted effort, sporadic efforts, I'd say, but really no concerted, consistent effort from the state itself to really look over all that spending and see whether, it's, whether, it's, whether it was wise, whether that money was being well spent. And um, I, I think that's, that's an, another, and so the creation of that office that had specific authority to oversee not only what state government was spending, but the state authorities, the towns, school districts, right down the line, is another lasting legacy from the campaign that, um, that I, I think will, will bear fruit years going forward. Thank you, Matt. I think that's a good point because I just uh, I want to highlight that we we're anticipating, as John Weingart mentioned, future panels that will focus on issues like infrastructure, ranging from you mentioned asset monetization, but the tunnel, which is something you'd been working on since your time in the Senate, and you'd secured funding for that, and school construction. Uh, another panel probably on on the general. Heather, 
Yes. Sorry, before you close, I think Brad wants to say something about uh, the other I point. want to ask a question. Not <laughs> say I'll, just, I'll just finish this thought and I'll turn Please. to the crowd. Uh, another on the school funding formula, obviously, and another that will harken back to your uh, inaugural speech. And then finally, a number of progressive victories, including uh, the abolishment of the death penalty and um, I always say it wrong, paid family leave or yeah. family leave insurance. Um, so a number of, but, but I did want to open it up in terms of in the nature of crowdsourcing what have we missed in, in Brad? No, I, my question is to what, um, what you all have been talking about. So both as it relates to ethics and to diversity and extending that to when it came to um, prosecutors and judges and insisting on greater diversity of appointment there. These things had enormous cost down the hall. And so as you all were thinking about this in the early stages, were you cognizant of how great the costs were going to be in our relationships with the legislature? We ask it. No. <laughs> no. Dave Rousseau, no. Did we do fine? Yes. That was Pat. That was Patty McGuire. <laughs> no, no, no. But Tom Shea, I, we got it done. I didn't. I would not. I would. I would say, um, in in all honesty, I would say we were we were obviously not unaware. Um, however, however, and I, and I, this will be this will this will be very much. Um, a part of the conversation about the budget. We very much, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm certain for a fact that it was viewed as arrogant by a lot of people down the hall, but our point of view was that John Corzine had very specifically been elected by the people of New Jersey to do things differently than they had historically been done in Trenton. And we felt very strongly about that. We felt like we had the moral high ground when it came to that argument. And I think absolutely we made some decisions that ruffled feathers down the hall because we took that point of view, um, which certainly was perceived as arrogant. It may even have been arrogant, but we felt like, but we felt like that's what we promised people we were going to do, and we were going to do that. So it's Patty McGuire again, and I'm going to end it so that everybody just gets to know how good it was. Patty always. I can it. tell you that I spent days in Dentist Cardinal's office on judgeships. <laughs> days, not just a day. That should tell everyone here what arrogant was like. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, so I'm Dr. Fred Jacobs. I was Commissioner of Health and Senior Services. I wanted to go back to the UMDNJ issue because Commissioners sit on the board of UMDNJ ex officio. And I was there that day uh, when Chris Christie walked in with his uh, staff and told us that unless you signed this deferred prosecution agreement, there would be an indictment. And because of the indictment, you would no longer have any Medicare funding. In other words, if he didn't sign it, the hospital would close the next day. University Hospital in Newark would close the next day. And you would think that that was a pretty simple decision to make. But in the session that followed, it was far from unanimous. There were people on that board who uh, didn't believe him, who felt that they wanted to call his bluff, quote unquote. And uh, Bob Del Tufo, I think, really took a very great leadership uh, you know, position by outlining how clearly, uh, how big a risk that would have been. That had we voted the wrong way, what would have happened the next day was just uh, inconceivable in terms of the, the health care of the city of Newark, the political uh, aspects of the city, all of it would have been, would have been terrible. So I'm, it sounded like easy, you know, the feds come in, they say you're going to be indicted unless you do this and everybody does it. That was not the, how it went down at all. Finally was a, uh, a, a vote, it was um, you know, closer than you might have expected it to be, but it, there it was. I wanted to make one other point because everybody has been so serious. See, I, I wanted to talk about the sense of humor, somewhat distorted, sense of humor that the governor had 
Um, so this is a very, very quick anecdote. I was this in, governor? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I, the very. I, I, <laughs> yeah, that's why I said it like that. I was in Atlanta, Georgia. It was September 12, 2006. And uh, I was in Atlanta, even though there was a travel ban, because the department was getting a national award for our HIV, a rapid HIV program. And there I was, and the phone rings, and the secretary says, Governor was on the phone. Gets on the phone and starts singing happy birthday to me. That's how I knew it was September 12th, because that's, that's my birthday for those who need to know that. Um, <laughs> and he sings happy birthday, and I'm, I'm really touched by this. I also told him, that don't give up his day job, because the Metropolitan Opera probably wasn't <laughs> going to call. And he says, um, there's going to be a hearing on needle exchange, which is going to occur uh, in the Senate Health Committee on Monday. I want you to go testify for that. And I said, well, you know, um, here's the problem with Monday. I promised that I'd be down at Burdett Tomlin Hospital in Cape May Courthouse uh, because I was tried to go there twice. And for some reason, it didn't work out. And now the doctors are canceling their office hours. They're going to be there. Van Drew is going to be there. Joanne Carasino, the CEO, is really looking forward to it. So I have to go. He says, but there's this hearing on Monday, and I want you to testify for it. And I'm the governor. And I said, and you know, I know that. And, and, and because of that, I can't tell you how bad it makes me feel <laughs> that I can't, I can't do this. God damn it, I'm the guy, I want you to testify at this hearing. What, what's the problem? I said, well, I gotta get from Trenton to Cape May Courthouse by noon. He says, well, what if I fly you down in my helicopter? I said, well, you know, uh, I'm an aviation nut, that sounds like a plan to me. He says, okay, you, get, you go, you testify at the hearing, go out to the airport, they'll fly you down to, uh, to the hospital. Great. So I go and I, 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 you know, I testify. Jay Jimenez is with me, he's chief of staff. We go out to the airport and there's not a state police helicopter. There's a private helicopter. And the guy says to me, the pilot, I've been flying for John Corzine for 18 years. So, and this is a nice helicopter. So we get in the helicopter, we fly down to Cape May Courthouse. He lands on this little postage stamp on top of the building. We get out and the helicopter takes off and flies away. <laughs> Jay says to me, where's the helicopter going? I said, I don't, I don't know. He said, what did the governor tell you? I said, he would fly us down to Cape May Courthouse. <laughs> and that was it. So we had to call the department, send the driver down. It's a three hour trip to pick us up. He thought it was the funniest thing since sliced bread. That's an expensive trip, Fred. <laughs> yeah, we got, lean, we got needless, Jay. <laughs> It's hard to that we did. Um, it's hard to, to top that. I, I want to be sensitive to time. Do you need us to wrap up? Yeah, I think I think we'll have to wrap up in a, in a minute to change the panel, right? Okay. Well, uh, so we got to let the lady. Ever. You're in charge, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. I want to be. Any, I mean, I just wanted to see. If, I think this has been a great discussion, and really do. This is just the start, and I hope this has gotten everybody's juices flowing in terms of so that we can follow up. So please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you. So this panel, as um, you see in your program, is on the initial uh, Corzine's first budget as governor, uh, the 2006 budget, which as we all recall, resulted in ultimately in the shutdown of the state government and um, subsequently an increase of um, one cent in the state sales tax. Um, and so I want to thank uh, all the members of the panel for being here. Brad Avalo obviously was the state treasurer, the first state treasurer. Um, Dave Rousseau and Bill Kastner, who you might all know as a Corsite administration state treasurer and a uh, chief counsel to the governor in the Corsite administration, are actually here as the staff representatives of the Senate Democratic Caucus and the Assembly Democratic Caucus in the 2006 budget fight. So even though they were subsequently Corsite administration We were officials. on the Red Sox, we were traded to the Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> um, so th they're, they're going to uh, give us some, some perspective um, from, from before they crossed over to the right side. Um, <laughs> and then obviously because, the, um, because that um, budget 
invite was such a um, public spectacle. Um, we have Josh Margolin here as well, who was with the Star Ledger at the time. Thanks, Josh, who will give us some perspective on how the fight was perceived and played out in the newsrooms and how it was covered um, by the by the state house press corps. And then Patty, of course, as she just told you, led all our negotiations with the state legislature, which she was very happy to have done and is grateful for the opportunity to serve. <laughs> <laughs> At like 6 a.m. in the morning, uh, 12th day, yeah. I think I cursed Bill Kasten or whatever. Um, so just by way of reminder, a little bit of... I, th I feel like I need to apologize to Bill Kastner before we even start because, <laughs> because because this did become such a big fight and he was on the other side at the time. But if we're going to be truthful and honest about what happened, then um, we, have, we have to tell it from our perspective. So I, I think um, the, the climate that we were in, as, as we talked about at the beginning of the last panel, uh, was one not only in which there was, you know, a perception of um, a climate in Trenton that wasn't working for the public. And that related, as we talked to, a lot of ethical issues, sort of pay to play kind of issues, government contracting, those sorts of things. But it also was, um, was evident um, in the, the state budget and sort of this recurring fights that were happening over the state budget um, each year due to a lack of resources to meet the spending needs of the state. Um, and as with the ethics issues during the campaign in 2005, we were um, very clear about positioning the governor or the senator at the time as someone who was going to take a, a brand new approach um, to budgeting issues in, in Trenton, obviously playing up his experience as the chief executive officer and chairman of Goldman Sachs as a, as a, um, as a credential to point to his ability to do that um, in Trenton. And so our, our primary focus on introducing the budget, and I'll ask Brad in a, in a moment to lay out some of the decision making and the thoughts that went into the initial budget proposal that we presented to the legislature in March. But our broad strokes thinking was that we were going to present a budget that um, ma that matched recurring revenues with recurring expenses, rather than um, using one time only um, revenues or gimmicks or so using rather than using say you know lawsuit settlement funds or rating. Um, independent agencies and some excess funds that they may have been lying about, which was money that might help fill the budget gap in that particular year, but wouldn't be available in the next year in the same way. And so we were very focused on introducing a budget that matched recurring, ex recurring revenues with recurring expenses. In order to do that, in our view, we needed to raise the sales tax by a penny, um, which raised about $1.1 billion dollars of what was a $4.5 billion shortfall in, I think was probably about a $30 billion budget at that in, in that particular year. I think it grew to 32 or 33 later in the administration, but I think that year was about $30 billion. Um, so that was our, our primary focus. Um, we felt very strongly about the budget um, as a demonstration of the things we promised the people of New Jersey, John Corzine, would do as governor. Um, and so we felt very strongly about it. And so I will say that I think there were probably were two things at play. First, on the merits, we thought this was the right way to approach the state budget. And we felt very strongly about that. We felt it was different than what had been done before. We felt very strongly about doing something that was different than what had been done before. I think that was our primary focus. That, that we were going to pass a, a budget that we thought was fiscally honest. Um, but I, I it would be dishonest of me to not say that there also was a political subtext of that, which I would say was the secondary, which is as a new freshman governor who had come in from out of town, that you know if you get pushed around by the legislature the first time you have a fight with them, 
then you're going to get pushed around by the legislature every time you have a fight with them. And so I think that was a little bit of the backdrop. I don't think it was. I think primarily we were very focused on the integrity of the budget and the process that we went through and the proposal that we made. But to, to ignore the political subtext would be, would be, I think, intellectually dishonest. So that, I think, is sort of the framework where, of where we started or where we were coming at it from. Um, and I think I'd like, I would, I'll ask Brad to talk about the initial, um, the initial proposal that we offered in March. And, um, you know, I, I think um, once we do that, I think this conversation, there's, there's so much territory to cover in this conversation <laughs> yeah. that I think, I think it, will, it will flow pretty freely. But if we could start with what the initial proposal was, then. I think we should keep the background to a minimum. Tom has actually covered uh, a lot of it. I think that the. Uh, and one of the further complexities that we faced was the expectation that the governor, with his background, and to some extent me and some of our other advisors, would have magic you know, that would help us to get out of this <laughs> um, problem without pain. And of course, the reality is you spend what you spend, and that's what you can cut from. And every dollar that's spent is important to someone. Um, and the uh, ways that you can raise additional revenue are also kind of known and limited, and they, by the way, have their own pain associated with all of them. And so the principles that I think came up earlier that the governor talked about were what was reflected in the budget. Um, Tom talked about being, you know, trying to match this idea of matching recurring expenses with recurring revenues, not borrowing money to cover, you know, the, the current expenses. Um, trying to be as efficient as we could. That's really hard to figure out, by the way, in like 30 or 60 days. And all of your friends in the cabinet, some of whom are sitting here today, not so friendly when you're asking them for ideas as to how they could spend less money. Um, that's not what anyone you know, came to Trenton to do. It's to do things that, that matter in people's lives. So that budget also, we did everything we could as we tried to at least demonstrate that we could reduce spending in some areas to do that in a way that it protected New Jersey's most vulnerable and uh, allowed a progressive agenda to move forward. Those are, you know, that needle is really hard um, to thread. I would say, um, you know, we also spent time trying to talk to the public about what was in the budget. I think it's not well understood. I came to think of it as just a giant recycling machine that the state takes in $30 billion of revenue, and most of that goes right back out to municipalities in the forms of, of grants and to support education. So um, when you talk about cutting, you're kind of chasing your own tail, and I think that was not well understood. The governor um, engaged in a series of town hall meetings. He dragged me along to a number of them. I remember it well, sitting on bar stools, trying to explain <laughs> this. And the governor's idea of a town hall was not typical, I think, of most governors. So that meant no selected audience, no, no prearranged questions. Everyone can come, ask whatever you want. My favorite was, and this is, I should probably stop with this, <laughs> sitting for like an hour and a half on this stool next to him answering questions. He finally looked at me. He's cursing at me. you got to say something. I'm like, well, I don't think they came to ask me questions. So I finally answered a question. And he got up and said, what Brad meant was. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I do think, though, that plays into the rest of our, of our conversation. Most of you know the governor pretty well. He, he actually you know, understood the budget in an extraordinary level of detail. And I think that was something that was unfamiliar in, in Trenton and affected all of us who worked with him and everyone down the hall as we went through the, through the process. So I'll stop there, Tom. Can I make a... What Brad change. meant to say. Um, <laughs> I think actually, if we're intellectually honest, though, we, we wanted to have recurring revenues match recurring expenditures. We weren't perfect at getting there. And I don't want anybody to think we're holier than thou, that we never, ever um, didn't tap into funds that we found. And as the, as the 
season went on as we got into 2008, 2009, we had absolutely no choice. Um, uh, there, was, we, there were no recurring revenues. <laughs> they, they were gone. And uh, so uh, this was a tough process. That's why it was so important to actually have revenues come in at the start of this thing because you had no chance of moving into uh, a situation where we should be recurring revenues, recurring efforts. That was the theme. But I don't want, I don't want anybody to, on film or otherwise, to think that we, we knew that we were being perfect about that. There was some carving of the edges because we had to. We, didn't, we couldn't get everything done that we needed to be doing uh, first bite. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I think um, at the time, again, for, for context, right, there had been in the previous year had been a budget fight between the Democrats in the Senate and Cody, who was both acting governor and, and Senate president, I guess, at the time, um, and, um, and the Democrats in the Assembly. And so... This um, there was there was additional um, political tension within the Democratic Party um, between the two houses of the legislature, and so I you know I I'd, I'd like to ask David and Bill to talk a little bit about the dynamics between the two houses of the legislature at the time one and then two the initial reception of the governor's proposal. In in March, right? But the 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 actual proposal, you know, the the budget proposal itself, and and the the ultimate shutdown or the budget deadline. There was about a hundred days or or more between when we proposed the budget um, and and the June thirtieth budget deadline. So um, we can talk through a little bit about how things changed things changed as we went through that time period. But I'm I'm curious if you guys could talk a little bit about both the the um, the relationship between the two houses and then how the initial budget proposal was received in the legislature. Yeah. I think um, you know I had the distinct pleasure of being Bill and I both had the distinct pleasure of being in the front lines of both of those battles. And in 2005, um, and I think this is what was, was what led to Dick Cody being more aligned with the governor than Joe Roberts at the time. Is Dick Cody went through that same th thought process in 2005 um, in the budget about whether to cut rebates or raise the sales tax. Um, Dick Cody ultimately went with cutting rebates because he actually thought that was the harder political move and that he would fall on the sword for that and then leave the sales tax for the future. Uh, little did we know um, that the assembly, who was running for that uh, year, because the assembly wasn't, the rebate issue was a big issue. And then also, little did we know that a gubernatorial campaign that we thought we were helping would join in the sidelines and say, oh, no, you shouldn't cut rebates. <laughs> um, you know, and that's, you know, that, that was a little bit of the mis, you know, some mis, and, and miscalculation there. And so I think that that led to when, um, you know, and that basically what it came down to that, that year in 2004. Five, I think it was just cutting rebates or not, or not cutting rebates. Look, I mean, the other dynamic here, and it's the elephant in the room, it's the elephant in the room right now in New, in New Jersey politics, is as every year went down the road, this north-south split became bigger and, and, and bigger. Um, when Jim McGreevy had to deal with it, it was not what Dick, when Dick Cody had it, and then it was not what John Corzine had to do it, and it's not what Phil Murphy has to deal with. With, with right now, but we got through that, and actually we got through. The, and it's, it was that was actually sometimes a lot nastier personally than what two thousand and six was. But I think what shaped the Senate reaction to the budget was Dick it was Dick Cody being governor, um, and understanding more about what the budget really was. And no offense to the Speaker and to the the Assembly side and to other senators having sat there in, in the, to make those to make those decisions. And actually, truthfully, you know, it wasn't until Dick became governor that he actually focused on the budget. His whole whole other career was on health care issues, and even when he was Senate president, he left the budget up to Bernie Kenny and and others. But once he came became governor, he realized what the budget really was, <laughs> and and what it what it what it meant. So I think Dick understood the dynamic of that we needed some recurring revenue. There were some early tremors with some what he viewed and I viewed as some cheap shots 
coming from the incoming administration on what, what, what Dick had done. But I think that, um, that Dick understood it eventually. I think um, having a former deputy treasurer who put four budgets together with him, he understood what it was. Um, having someone who's dear to a lot of us who also is no longer here, having a Kathy Crotty there was a tremendous asset. And somehow, I don't know how we did it, somehow we kept the entire, he kept the entire Senate aligned. Where even though the South Jersey guys and the assembly was being driven, that the Wayne Bryants of the world, the Steve Sweeney's of the world never switched over. I mean, we know Wayne, Wayne Bryant, it was made clear to him. You want money for, remember, it's the governor's office that decides how much money goes to Camden, not the legislative leaders. And Wayne, for all his other faults, Wayne understood things like that. So we were able to keep the entire Senate unified. So we didn't have that internal split that we had, that we had to worry about. And then as we moved forward, um, it's probably about this time, 12 years ago, where I basically became a wholly owned subsidiary of, because of the relationship between Governor Corzine and Dick Cody, a wholly owned subsidiary of the, um, of the administration and was working for, I do this when I talk to civics classes, I mean, don't ever believe, I was actually working for both branches of government at, this, at, the, same, <laughs> at the same time. Um, and I think it was that, that that dynamic led to how, this, how, how the sides were, were picked on this. And the other dynamic I think that was very important, and it's actually something that you can play a lot of things going on back then to today. The other thing that was very important in this whole structure was um, that Joe Cryan, was able to keep enough people, I think, what did you have in the, you only had a majority of like 44, 40, 42, 43 maybe even, right? It wasn't, it wasn't today's majority. It was about 48. Four, it was 48, okay, so Joe was able to keep enough people aligned with him, but the assembly could never force something down the Senate's throat, and I think that that shaped the dynamic of, of where we were. Now as we get down, you know, I'll let Bill talk more about that dynamic before we later go back to more about how we ended up coming to a deal and everything at the end. First of all, thank you for not booing me. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> I think I agree with, um, I think, how Tom posed the question and, and what Dave was saying. I think the Corzine administration was inheriting a pretty adversarial climate to begin with through no fault of the administrations. I think the previous year, as Josh reported, almost ended up in a, in a state shutdown. You had north-south politics. You had um, policy debate over the importance of property tax rebates. Uh, assembly was had a chip on its shoulder that the Senate wouldn't do a constitutional convention on property taxes. So you have kind of um, the, the assembly felt surprised at, at the budget address the year before. So you have a little bit of that backdrop. And then um, the assembly reaction was, um, holy cow, wait a minute, the governor is up in, you know, he's, the governor has three or four years to recover from this. We have primaries next June. Um, the administration's playing poker with our money politically. Um, we, you know, some of us were around for Governor Florio when Democrats were sent to Siberia for over a decade, Watergate type majorities for Republicans. That was over the sales tax that was increased and then repealed. You had paid professional pollsters coming in, briefing the assembly caucus saying, this is, this is horrible. We, you can't, you know, you guys are barely keeping a finger in the dike of the McGreevy tax increases, and now you're going to have an identifiable sales tax increase. This is, um, you guys have to fight this at every turn. And then you had policy uh, concerns as well. To some degree, sales tax regressive, that was certainly not an overriding um, uh, concern. Sales tax being dedicated to the general fund, you heard a lot of chirping on that. This money's just going to be pissed away. We'll never see it again. We have a chance. If we're going to raise, if we're going to put our necks out and raise the sales tax, we should, you know, make sure it's it's for something like property taxes. So you kind of had a, you kind of had a, a disgruntled assembly to begin with, um, a a a a led an assembly that that um, felt like it was on the, it was going to be the guinea pigs uh, when it comes to when it came to the um, accountability of raising the, the sales tax and then uh, ultimately a um, I, I would argue a, prop, a, a a policy concern about dedication of the revenue patty so i think what we forgot to talk about was the fact that there was subpoenas there was Tom Kane, Senator Kane, and the Republicans on the Christmas tree list. 
So if we start when we walk through the door and Brad Abelo was establishing the budget the first year, if everyone recalls, and Josh, you're gonna recall because you wrote the stories, was we had all of this, we took out a lot of items in the budget. And those items were perceived as Christmas tree lists. And then Chris Christie made lots of noise about it to the fact that during the budget time for us toward the end in June, we all got subpoenaed. I got subpoenaed more than once. They thought I was, Probably two or three times. You got subpoenaed, governor got subpoenaed, Stu Rabna, Brad Ablo. So all of this is also going on. You have legislators who are like, okay, you guys introduce a budget, very similar to what's happening now. All of the things are outside that we put in. And we've got Chris Christie saying that these, Chris, these are gift items, quote unquote, or I don't know if that's the real word to use. And all of a sudden, we have legislators who are on their, their heels, not liking our budget to begin with. And then as we begin the process, and as we go forward, we then come up to the fact of two other houses, Assembly and Senate, having their own difficulties. And I bring this out because I think people forget that that occurred and that for us, you know, I didn't really like the fact that I was subpoenaed by a U.S. Attorney General and I've got to sit and go through a whole bunch of lists and go through everything. So I really wasn't liking a whole lot of people <laughs> at all in the legislative branch. Um, and Tom Kane and Tom Neff and everybody, you know, decided that, you know, I was going to be one of their favorite players uh, in this. So that started for me in being able to sort of watch everybody. Um, I will say something, and I want to really be on record about this. John Corzine is not this person who wasn't accessible and didn't have conversations with people about legislation and about policy. First of all, I personally had a open door policy. Any legislator at any time could walk into the state house and find their way to my office. And they did, okay, number one. Number two is if the governor was in that building and a legislator was in my office, the governor saw them. So as much as I love the legislature, and I really do, you know, there's a 50-50 line here. You, know, you want to say that maybe we didn't always communicate, whether I didn't communicate correctly or the governor didn't communicate, but I will not accept and do not accept the concept that John Corzine was not a governor who understood legislation, politics, and wasn't accessible, because that's not true. And I will say this to you, Bill Kastner, who Bill is a friend, and you know, after the budget, we ended up doing some great stuff together on housing and other things. However. However, <laughs> did you ever know, did you ever think that we had a compromise going with the Republicans? Because how we stopped this whole budget situation was the Republicans who stayed with us in the assembly budget. Joe Cryan, Bill Payne were with us, which Bill, you knew. But I do not think you knew, no, with us, I don't think you knew that I had f f five Republicans. That was Blee, Malone, Allison, Mahose, and O'Toole. So I had four of them. So I don't know if you ever knew that I had that. I don't think they, the, the reporters knew it, but those guys camped out in my office. And we crafted, with everyone's approval, a strategy never to vote for the assembly budget. And part of doing that was to stop the process. The longer we did this, the greater our impact was going to be, which I think happened. Yeah, I think, um, as I said, we introduced the original budget proposal in March, and the, and the deadline was um, the 30th. But it took quite a while. Um, it took quite a while for the assembly to, to come up with a proposal of their own, ultimately, which was you know, fairly late in the process, um, I think. And so I think that that had something to do with the eventual outcome of the budget fight, because I think it put us in a position of strength relative to the assembly. Um, but then I also think one of the other determining factors as the fight dragged on was, um, was, was the fact that the assembly couldn't produce the votes to put out a budget of their own. Right. So we were, we were always in the position of saying, um, you know, we've been very clear about what our priorities are and what we want to see in a budget. 
but we were never put in a position to have to veto one or line item veto one um, because the assembly didn't have the votes to produce it. And a lot of that is due to the work that Patty was talking about that was being done, both both by Joe Cry and, and then by some of the Republicans as well in the assembly. Yeah, I, I would add, I think that it would the dynamic may have been completely different if they had sent a budget to the Senate. Sure. And then it's sure. the pressures on Dick Cody to be the one that, okay, you're the one now shutting down government. That that dynamic may have been may it may have been different. But you know, history shows that we were successful with both the Republicans understanding that it was better to be friends with a governor's office than a speaker's office in the law in the long term. And and, and Joe Cryan keeping that core group having to use the treasurer to using people in the administration for his staff work and having to use me in the Senate Democratic office as doing his staff work, having to use the Senate parliamentarian for things rather than the assembly parliamentarian. But I think that the history may have been different that if they had, if you had had the votes to force it down, to send it, to send an actual bill to the Senate, not just have a printout out there of a, of a right. bill. Right. I agree with that. And you benefited from the fact that Dick Cody was willing to dislike Joe Roberts more than he disliked John Corzine at the time. <laughs> and and that's George Norcross. I was gonna say I don't know how you yeah. I don't know how you guys managed to do that, Bill. No, no, that knowing, was virtually right. impossible no, to work out. No, no, knowing the knowing the play, I think it I think it was more like this said it. I'm not sure it was a personal animosity between Dick and Joe. It was no, right. somewhat it was another exactly. figure. But but by 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 People forget that, that Dick Cody served, and is still serving, unless something happened today, in the legislature. <laughs> he, he's a remarkable um, operator in the State House. And, and he, you had him on your team, you had Wayne Bryan on your team, and you had Bill Gormley on your team. And Patty, that's, that, those, those are three key players who you know, were able to keep it from the assembly sending you a bill that you couldn't, that you couldn't endorse in any way. Well, right. It had to get. They didn't have the votes to get it out of the assembly. I mean, that was that was the bill could go nowhere because we kept jamming it. If you go back and you look at all the committee meetings, that would stop and go and stop and go for hours upon hours upon time. They never could get the votes. I mean, the, I mean, Bill and Speaker Roberts just couldn't get the votes required to get that bill out. And I think that, for us, was the biggest piece to it. Um, Gormley, clearly, his involvement, you know, was... was and Cody had kept Essex yes. on your team. And, of course, we kept Tutson. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember, we always kept Tutson. Right. Well, first of all, Ruth, I need to come back for the Chris Christie panel to talk about the shutdown I won last year. That's only fair. Yeah, 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 that's <laughs> it's only fair. <laughs> But I, I, th I think beyond what you're discussing, I think um, the governor had the upper hand in terms of earned media and the idea of enough of Trenton budget gimmickry, and we're going to get rid of these one shots and kick the can was a was a was a phrase the governor used repeatedly and quite successfully, in my view. And so the there there was I think just the an overall mood that Trenton is broken, and who in their right mind would want to raise the sales tax unless it was completely necessary. I thought I said this to Tom when we talked over the weekend. What I found most interesting was Quinnipiac did a poll about the necessity of the sales tax two weeks before the shutdown. And roughly two thirds um, of registered voters said the increase was not necessary. Two weeks after the shutdown, it was a complete reversal. Mm -hmm. So although not by design, it, it is very, very interesting in that the shutdown created the public crisis that ended up providing the legislators who felt like they had no cover whatsoever in voting for a sales tax increase that they actually, you know, they actually got a pass. So I thought that was an important yeah, takeaway. I, I mean, we could do a whole day panel on just the th the theatrics of the budget shutdown, right? So we, the, the assembly finally um, produced a, a proposal late in June, probably right near the deadline, as I recall, um, which we then responded to by casting as more of the same, right? One shots, gimmicks, borrowing, um, revenue estimates that were a little too rosy in our view. And so, and that's where, that's where the, the ultimate stalemate actually happened, right? Because now you have, you don't have a bill, but you at least have a proposal, um, which we dismissed and discounted. Um, we have a, an actual budget draft that you guys have um, dismissed and say is a dead on arrival, right? As Joe, as Joe said during the fight, and so then we get to the point where 
where the shutdown happens. And that's, I think, where things get really interesting. So I'm, I'm curious, Josh, too, about your perspective on, like, from that point on, right? I think, first of all, I think, I don't think you guys thought that we were actually going to do that. Right. So, so the, the rule among the reporters always was everybody threatens a shutdown. Everybody does all sorts of theatrics associated with it. McGreevy at one point even polled on whether or not he could paint the Republicans as being blamed for a shutdown if he were to go ahead with a shutdown during his administration. So we just viewed it as noise. Then all of a sudden, the last week comes, gets really, really hot in the state house. This time, actually, the Delaware was rising and about to flood out the state house. So it was, it was particularly biblical this time, and maybe that was, that was an important omen, I guess, in retrospect. But the, the heat rises, literally and figuratively. Bill Gormley always decides he needs certain things for Atlanta County, and he starts giving lists to people. Blind quotes get planted in various stories. And it still doesn't have the feeling of reality at all because there's always a deal at the 11th hour with McGreevy. We had to go till 2 o'clock in the morning or something, but it's always going to happen. Then Governor Corzine and you decide to wheel the cot into the office. That was a good picture. And, um, you know, there was some discussion about whether or not... The, 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 there, was, there was some discussion about whether or not um, the governor was going to change his underwear. I don't know how that wound up in the Star Ledger. But where he had only one suit. But there was an interesting moment for us happened. And I, I hope I'm not revealing, well, I'm revealing something, so I hope you don't mind. But, um, but we, we had a, a lot of things. <laughs> you, by, you, by comparison, you won't mind this one. You, you forget, Josh, we ultimately <laughs> hired all of your colleagues at the time. So we know everything. So, so I had a conversation the, the Saturday before the, the deadline with the governor and with Tom where it actually, for the first time, dawned on me that I was going to experience a government shutdown. That was, this was actually real. This was going to happen. And it didn't seem like you, you knew exactly how it would play out, but you knew that you were going to do it because you felt that the impasse was unbreakable at that point. So the Star Ledger's coverage, I think, if you, if you look at the tone of, of the news poll, the news pages, you will find that there was a distinct difference in the coverage going into that final week, a lot more gravity to it. And then as it occurred, um, you know, we're talking about the, these, these late night assembly committee meetings. We didn't know, at least I personally didn't know how the sides were lining up. There was a point during that, that, uh, that violent, near violent meeting in the assembly budget committee where we actually thought that the assembly had the upper hand. We didn't know the game or the strategy that you had manipulated and created and, and, and how it was going to play out until people, I was, I was back in the newsroom and I think Joe who's here and, and some other colleagues of mine were, were in the committee hearing room and it played out and then you, then you texted or emailed me saying, how do you like them apples? But you know, we, we, had, we had no real idea that it was going to play out the way that it was. But I do want to point out in terms of just the, the theatrics of that period, um, I found a great clip as I was trying to uh, plan for this last night. So this is from the July 5th papers. This is the old days. The story was actually written July 4th. It was not written just 12 seconds before it was posted. And so the story, it's, uh, it, w it was actually a great color piece, but it ran on page six. So there's an editor I'm going to have to talk to later. Um, the New Jersey legislature is no place for sissies these days. Profanity erupts on the assembly floor. A wrong look gets you a dirty look. A stray remark gets you one back, bub. And watch out for ricocheting wads of paper. Quote, we have chaos, Assemblyman Bill Baroni said. So that was New Jersey government at its finest. I, think, I also think it's worth noting that the, that the tone and tenor of the negotiations were really different pre-shutdown and post-shutdown. Um, much more contentious, much more difficult after the shutdown. I, I, I still can remember a look on Bill's face in one particular negotiation in the, in the, in the governor, at the conference table in the governor's office. And we had essentially, I think it was probably when we had rejected your most recent proposal. Um, and we were having, a blue, I think, a brief sort of political conversation. And I just remember this look on Bill's face as we let the meeting break without any agreement. And he looked at me with this look that was equal parts exasperation and terror and just complete disbelief that this is what was happening. I think that's how I always look. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, the, what, there was one other subtext that was sort of, one, or, or subplot that was that was omitted, and it was, the legislature was testing Governor Corzine. Absolutely, he was, a, he was a new governor, and that's always the, the way the way it has to go. But remember, Joe Roberts was a new speaker, and so he felt a performance anxiety among his own caucus. Now, Cody again has the upper hand because he's already been governor, he's been Senate president for God knows how long. He doesn't have any of these performance issues right there, and he's got a much more you know the Senate. It still is a little bit the longer terms, the different cycle. His caucus it's, it's a, is more manageable. It's more manageable. Yeah. It's a yeah. smaller caucus. Yeah. And, and he was a master of the rules of his house in a way that nobody else really was. So, so Roberts actually had a lot to prove. So every one of those meetings, when he's not getting somewhere, he, he probably, I mean, it seemed like he psychologically felt he was losing ground. Yeah. But I mean, th this just had to be a field day for you guys, right? Because you start off with, you start off with, the chairman of the assembly budget committee calling Brad to testify, who refuses to come he testify. Sent, he sent sending a trooper. A sent sending a trooper troopers and sergeant <laughs> and the, sar the assembly sergeant at arms to, to, to drag Brad to the committee, which ultimately didn't nice. happen. And then, <laughs> although Brad did go to testify actually the next night. Yeah and acquitted himself quite well, I, th I think. And I would say that Lou was actually embarrassed by the exchange and wound up, wound up recessing the committee um, for a half an hour. Um, as, well, let me, I shouldn't say that. He said he was recessing for a half an hour. And then they never came back. And I remember, and Bill I remember. Gormley, Bill Gormley gave me a LeBron James T-shirt. <laughs> I still have. I couldn't find it. But I was going to bring it the day after that. Because no, I the, remember. The administration always knows the budget better. So, so Corzine and you and Patty and Avalo all knew it better. But that really wasn't necessarily going to be determinative. Yeah. It was going to, you know, the, the, the sheer knowledge of facts isn't always the most important thing in politics. <laughs> and, 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 and so, so that wasn't really going to be the issue. But, but there was also a, a level. You also, first of all, to answer your first question, yes. The governor said earlier that being governor was the best job of his life. The best job of my career, more than 25 years, is being a state house reporter in New Jersey during this period in the early 2000s. So, and the shutdown was remarkable. It was remarkable for all of the politics and 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 the significance of all of the politics that were going on. But you also, after a day or two, when you felt that it was more real than you had anticipated it was going to be. You started playing politics in a way you hadn't been. So you started talking about running ads, and the governor's well, bottomless so, wallet so, started so being So I was going to say, so there were, I was going to say that why this was such a field guide day for you guys was because of the theatrics. And so the summoning of Brad and the sending of troopers is sort of the beginning of that. But then the governor called the legislature into special session. He brought the cot to the state house. Um, he gave you know a speech every morning for, what, four? four mornings or so. Um, so all of that. And then, yes, ultimately, um, I think I called Mike Donilon and said, why don't you just show up at the State House and just make sure lots of people see you? Because Mike Donilon was the guy who did our TV spots at the time. And we started talking about running ads against the legislature on the budget. Um, not publicly, but I do think that was, I think that was, I think that actually, I think there was a, a there were a few things during the shutdown that actually, were sort of key determining points in what actually happened. The first was, at some point, the Assembly Democrats proposed an increase in the income tax on high net worth individuals, which was starting to get some traction until Brad ran the numbers and it showed that the impact of that income tax increase would fall 10% on the southern New Jersey counties and 90% on the northern New Jersey counties. And so then any support for that very quickly fell apart in the north-south divide. One. Two, the ultimate, you know, the casinos were able to fend off closure for a few days while they were in court. But I think the ultimate closure of the casinos um, and its impact in particular on the South Jersey legislatures, I think, was one of the key factors that ultimately led to an agreement. Um, and then I think on a, on a much on a, on a on a on a smaller scale, this this idea that we did float not publicly, but, you know, through the 
through the media that we were considering running um, TV ads. Your alter ego, um, source close to the governor. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, oh, that said, guy. I, think what, I think what you said about the casinos was a big issue. That I remember the assembly committee going into committee thinking they were going to be able to release a bill from committee and then vote on to it. Declare to declare casino employees And then, for, again, force that to the Senate right. where, where, again, Patty threw her magic and others threw her their magic, kept all the Republicans off of it. There were enough Democrats to stay off it. And I think that, that the next day, I think, is where – we, we came to the ultimate agreement. We're on the Senate Al side. We, we, knew, we I, all knew all along it was going to be a 50-50 split. Is I, we I think they created, uh, the, the things I just talked about, I think <laughs> created more pressure points yes. on the Assembly Democrats. Yeah. Bill, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I, but. I, I think I disagree a little bit in that towards the end, it was a lot of, um, it was a shrewd move. The um, you know the Assembly would say, this has got to be about, about property taxes, property taxes, and this idea of dedicating half of the penny towards property taxes really was a checkmate situation. Well, I, I was going to say that but ultimately that, the governor's idea was what brought the deal, but I felt like we had created a lot of pressure. I think that that's point. fair to say. Don't discount battle fatigue as someone who was in that caucus and saw the body language of legislators, you know, four or five days into a shutdown, um, people who liked the governor personally mm -hmm. and supported the governor personally. Like, what are we, you know, can't we work this out, guys? You know, it's one thing to have the testosterone and the pollster and you're going to get killed. And then when you're four or five days into a shutdown, you're hearing about casino workers who may not get a paycheck. And, and then it, and it has a sobering effect. And then I think the governor did two things. The one of which was the night before, which was an idea that hadn't occurred to anybody before. And the other was a, a spur of the moment ad lib, I think, in the speech the next day. And the, the, so the first idea was, yeah, this idea of not just of, of dedicating a half of the revenue from the increase in the sales tax to property tax relief, but it was dedicating that money for the next decade. So not just that year for that budget, but for the next 10 years was the idea that he came up with at the end that I think sort of tilted it. And then the next day in his daily speech to the legislature, you know, he called on the legislature to solve this problem today right. and repeated the word today several right. times. So and I think that was, you know, that, that was playing to the battle fatigue that, right. that Bill just, just and I alluded think, to. And I, and I also think that, you know, we, during this time period, went and met with quite a few of the legislators and had conversations with them. Um, and I think, Bill, to go to your point, absolutely there are those who really liked Governor Corzine and didn't want to be in this situation, right? And so um, that helped the cause. I mean, one of the things I want to be uh, say is that without God rest his soul, the late Alex de Croach, who played a really big role in allowing his members and his relationships with myself on behalf of the governor. I mean, you know, he was a, a, play, a, a real player, as was Joe Malone. Assemblyman Joe Malone was clearly the person uh, who shepherded, helped, worked with me uh, on this. And I must say that this battle, as bad as it was, helped me create the votes I needed for school formula funding when the speaker gave too many Democrats a walk. So I'm sorry about the close, but closing down a state government, and I feel terrible about it, but that gave me an opportunity to be able to build a real relationship that gave me the votes for school formula funding. Well, to, to our vantage point, you know, watching the, the movements and, and at the point of, of the shutdown, so the press corps had now swelled because all the New York and Philadelphia yes. me media had descended on the shutdown New Jersey State House. And we're all following the, the, the red rope was, t was put outside the governor's office. We were watching everybody's movements. The governor was using the secret passages to go from office to office. But there were, there were, curtain, there were certain things that actually started happening. And as I remember, I may be wrong, but as I remember, when the governor actually left his office to go meet with Roberts in his office, just that small um, gesture of, of going to the other side of the building in a way that governors in New Jersey historically don't because the governor of New Jersey come to me. And so Governor Corazon got up, the troopers had to run to keep up with him, and, and he went over there. And at this point, there was so much, everyone was so drained, it was so emotional, and, and little things made it possible for the log jam to be broken. I would, I, I would say just, uh, you know, since this is, all, this is about the Corazon administration and the archives, and this is not necessarily um, um, apropos simply of the budget, but I would say that historically, both 
in his term in the Senate and in the assembly and in the in the in the, um, in the governor's office is that was the kind of thing that most politicians would care a lot about that John Coors I never cared about. So whereas most politicians would say, I don't want somebody to see me going out, that will be perceived as weakness. Um, that was just not the kind of thing that would ever occur to him. He would say, I want to get a deal. And if I need to go to, have a, if I need to, go to his office to make him feel better to get a deal, I'm going to go do that. Um, and so I think that was something yeah. that, that, that you, you know, if we looked at different situations over, over time, you would find that that happened fairly frequently, not in necessarily in that exact way, but that mentality or that mindset, I think, was, was pretty consistent most of the time. Yeah, I agree. I thought that was magnanimous, and I think Patty said something important. In the, I thought it was also magnanimous for the governor in the interest of the state and the party um, in the wake of a bloody uh, shutdown, historic shutdown, um, picking right back up and, start, and having a special session on property taxes, which led to Matt Boxer's position, the comptroller, which led to a revised school funding formula, which led to reasonable benefits reform. So I thought that was really an incredible gesture rather than, um, than, than to kind of harbor ill will. Let's get the state back on track on these other important policy issues. Let's, housing. That was one of yeah. the, speakers, the speaker's biggest yeah. issue. I, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta interject one thing here. There, there is one person that had a lot of help in this, and I, and I, I wanna go back to one of the things I said right at the start of the afternoon. People make a big difference. Patty McGuire knew how to make this crap work. And this was an education for yours truly to understand all these various connections that we've been talking about. Um, Tom's right, we, we're less into form and substance uh, and more into substance. Uh, but without getting Bill Gormley's help over and over again, actually, in the first two years when he retired, yep. I think actually it was a big, big hole in our administration going forward. Uh, and, and we lost Malone because he used to pull him along. And there were a lot of things that uh, Patty really engineered in a way that uh, made a lot of these good things that ultimately go back to what we were talking about on an agenda actually happen. Yeah, I was, I was going to interject the same thing on Gormley, but also, you know, Joe Cryan, we talked a little yeah, bit earlier, true. Joe Cryan, um, Gormley, and Bernie Kenny, too, yes. were all big parts of, um, of the administration of the governor, of us ultimately being successful in this, in this fight, because they, they, they all did a lot of work. The Christmas tree helped, too. <laughs> <laughs> Which was called the Mac machine. Remember that? Yeah, yeah that's yeah, no, that's what I'm talking about. One well, of you know, the Mac machine, the Mac machine was the McGreevy well, administration. Yeah, right. Yeah. But, but what I think what, what I think what Joe is talking about is what Joe's talking about is that when, which was not the brightest not the brightest time of the shutdown was when we spent that night in the conference room, um, spending spending spending, and I think I leaned over to Brad at one time and said, Brad, I think we need two cents on the sales tax now, and we realized that. And the Republicans remember remember what happened. The Republicans that night in the budget debate railed on you shut down government so that you could spend three hundred million dollars. I'm using this word affectionately on crap. Um, you know, so some of it was legitimate things, but one t one legislator would say, I need money for this town, then somebody else would say, I need it for this town. And if you if everybody remembers correctly, the governor heard that and the next day had to make the decision to basically made a political decision to cut back a lot of that stuff that had been added the night before. And we you did, got, yeah, we did veto a lot I of that, I mean, and, you know, I got the strange call where, remember, at that point in time, I'm working for Dick Cody. I'm working no. for the people who put the money right. in the budget. I get a call from Brad saying, we need you to come in and help us work on the line item veto to take stuff out that your employer <laughs> <laughs> just, put into the, just put into the budget. And that was, I think that was something, that was not a glowing day for any of us that at the end of the shutdown, that that is what we came we, we came out of, but I guess after your veto, we came to a more reasonable yeah. place. And we also right. came to, Brad and I, an agreement that we were doing away with Christmas trees in all of the other kinds of reforms that were going on. And that basically ended. I mean, it's not, you know, it wasn't perfect, but. The reporters really missed it. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I, I do think that this, this was 
gave our administration, the team, confidence to face off on a lot of other things going forward. Uh, it's not the way you would like to learn the ways of Trenton, but it was a necessary reality uh, if you were actually going to make serious reforms on moving to the pay-as-you-go uh, as opposed to the normal ways you were doing business. And I think it's set up, actually, even though Joe Roberts and I had probably the tensest of moments, ended up having a, actually a colleague that I could work with because we both knew we had to figure out how to back away from this thing uh, in a way that, not back away from the principles, but back away from the tension to be able to get things going. And, uh, and he ended up being a good partner from that point on. Well, well Governor, I, he, uh, he, he um, it's interesting. I do think there were motivations of some party bosses who want to make the executive branch a subordinate interest to the, legislat the legislative branch. And I don't think that's where <laughs> Speaker Roberts was looking at it we, from the position of I need to protect I need to protect the interests of my caucus members. We, not can, I need to not we, I need to emasculate emasculate the executive. Somewhat branch. aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> and can so I, I think for that, let me just finish the thought real quick. Sorry, Patty. Was. Um, I think for that reason, along uh, that reason, I think that's why it was a successful partnership going forward, and I think it was a um, a great show of leadership. It is interesting, Alan Rosenthal. Where's Ruth? In Engines of Democracy, he was the, like the only one who loved what the legislature did because he said, "This is the legislature trying to stand up. It knew it, knew it didn't have much of a, a, a shot to win, but it stood up institutionally and fought for its prerogative. They never stand up to governors, but it ended up being, a, I think, a great show of leadership for the governor. I do, I do think it set the tone." for the other future successes. I think Bill Kastner won't give himself enough credit, but Bill Kastner deserves a whole lot of credit for his relationship during that time, but our relationship, at least my three years in the administration, which most people don't even realize, is that every Wednesday, the Senate and Assembly and the Governor's Office legislatively met every single Wednesday in Bill Kastner's office. So again, everybody, when people say they didn't know what was going on, I'm not sure how folks didn't always know what was going on when we were meeting, but I want to be, I wanted to make sure everybody understood that Bill Kastner himself and his relationship should be very much applauded as David and as Kathy Crotty and as we move the pieces on for everything that they did. So I want to make sure. Thank you. Well, I, you know, I think both, I think Bill and the governor are both right in the sense that um, as, a, as a sheer, um, as a sheer matter, matter of real politics, that um, n not only was it essential for the governor to win that fight to be able to govern for the rest of his term, um, you know, I think had we failed, um, you know, we wouldn't have gotten any of the things done, or most of them that happened later on in the administration without having won that fight. I think not, not only because it created the relationships that Patty talked about that set the stage for some of those other fights, but it demonstrated to the legislature that this was a governor who was gonna lead, you know, not just the party, but the state. And so I think, um, you know, I think people were more willing to look at him as the leader after that fight than they might have been before it. And I think that was probably critical to a lot of successes that happened later on in the administration. Chris, sure. Uh, Chris Calori, the one footnote is during the entire shutdown, there were 20 departments that had to function, mm -hmm. which I think was no small feat. And that mm -hmm. was because the governor insisted that every department function at its highest level through the shutdown. I think that has to be noted through this discussion. That's a good, point. A good reminder. That's a really yeah. good point. There any, are there any, um, any other members of the cabinet that want to speak to that, actually? Yeah, I, I, I do, Tom. Steve Goldman, right here. Hi, Steve. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember the preparation that was done, actually, even before the shutdown came. We had meetings in the governor's office. Mm -hmm. Stu Rabner at that time was counsel to the governor, and we each, each department sat together with Stu and with members of the governor's staff going over what our rights were, how we would be funded, how it would work. So the fact that the government continued to function despite the shutdown wasn't by happenstance. It was because there was a lot of preparation mm -hmm. that went into that anticipating that there might be a shutdown, and that was, I thought, very well done and, 
and important. Yeah, I don't know that it. I don't know that it ultimately um, contributed to the outcome, but I think the exercise that Brad um, led and went through with the members of the cabinet, as well, to identify the cuts that would have to happen within each department if the governor's budget didn't pass, mm -hmm. um, I think had to at least catch the attention of members of the legislature because of its impact, particularly on municipal aid um, and, and school funding, I think. But, but I do think since this is an official recorded session that I should share this detail that um, when we shut the government down, of course, that means you can't pay employees who are furloughed. When um, I went to the folks in Treasury who had the payroll responsibility, it turned out our system was 40 years old and didn't have that capability. It was just on off. So actually, uh, yeah. so what are you admitting to right now? You paid everybody, even the issue. What, what's the confession? <laughs> Is there a reporter still working for a no, <laughs> no, here? No if, you, if you, no, if you remember, there was language added into the budget that was allowed us to pay the people who hadn't worked. Right. And that was a contentious piece yes, I know. at the end, yeah, at the one of the last pieces. But it was good that we did that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Tom, I, one last footnote from the, in terms of the, the public view of all this, and I think it was Bill or, or Dave had mentioned earlier the, the polling uh, that came out after the shutdown about the, the public perception about the sales tax increase. You know, I'm sure that you did didn't do this intentionally, shut down the government up, up and everybody's life for it. But the the media exposure and the story ended up catapulting the governor to a level of national attention that he had not had to that point. And actually, um, I would I'd love to get your take on it because there was a sense coming into the budget shutdown. You had a fairly good first few months, but not a great first few months. You you know the governor was new to this. The legislature was entrenched in and testing. You had a couple of stumbles in terms of people, you had a big fight to keep crying as the, or make him the, the party chair, which ended up being valuable in the shutdown. But, um, you know, there were things that were possible now, July 15th, that probably were not possible June 15th. Um, I think that's right. But I also think, um, I also think there were, as the governor mentioned at the top, it might have been at the top of the last panel. You know, we walked into so many problems. The four and a half billion dollar budget deficit was just one of them, right? But the the state police were under federal supervision on racial profiling. We were being sued um, and trying to create the new Department of Child Welfare, the UMDA and J scandal we were dealing with at the time. So there there were a lot of things that were we, we were being forced to be necessarily reactive on that wouldn't have been part of our agenda. But I don't, I, I don't disagree um, with, your, with your premise. And obviously, we didn't go into it thinking that way. But I think, I mean, politically, I think it was clearly a win for the governor, probably in ways that we didn't expect. We expected, you know, we believed that, as I said at the beginning of the panel, we believed that having a fight with the legislature over a budget that looked like the kind of budget John Corzine promised the people of New Jersey during the campaign he would pass. We thought that was a fight worth having for him as governor, particularly given his background and, and, and the skill set that we brought to the table. Not only did we think it was a fight worth having, we probably thought um, it was a fight that we had no choice but to have. Um, so that was really our thinking going into it. But I think coming out, for sure, it was politically, it strengthened him politically a lot in the state, and it raised his profile nationally. I would agree with that, yeah. It also uh, created a situation with the rating agencies, rating agencies and people who were evaluating our credit in a way that New Jersey had not been able to send a message to investors and others that we were actually serious about dealing with this so that there were a lot of secondary implications and while we never got an upgrade while we were in office although we tried we never got a downgrade the whole time and a lot of that was because we had sent the message not only to the legislature but to other people that we were serious I, about I think the next guy got a, got a couple of downgrades. <laughs> that, that wasn't my point. I think that's not my but, point. But I not think my... we could end on that note because I think we've, John, John looks like he wants to speak. And... Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to ruin this. Um, 
the governor had an incredible team, uh, to state the obvious. But when, as I look at this exercise real quick, um, I think it speaks more to the governor's strength and his integrity. I, I think I don't think when I think of Governor Coors, I don't think necessarily of uh, abolition of capital punishment or school aid or paid sick leave. I think of having been his lawyer for a year, albeit fourth stringer, not like Chief Justice Ravner, first stringer. Um, just the integrity and honesty um, and, and strength and leadership. That's that's how that's how I remember Governor Coors. It was a privilege to work for him. I really was. Thank all the, the panelists and Governor Corzine. You want to have the last word? <laughs> First of all, let me go back to where we started. Thank you all for being here. It is it's both great to see you and and then to revisit some of those things that I think were special moments for us to work together. And there were many more that followed. And you guys did an incredible job in all of our little parts and you know hopefully we get uh, the ability to tell this story to anybody that actually wants to listen the world goes on and who cares but the fact is is that uh, there are a lot of really great things that were done and that's because of the people in this room and uh, if I'd been a better politician listen to Mag Patty on a few other things later down the line maybe we would have had a uh, different outcomes on other things but I am very very proud of the people that spoke today and all of you for what you do. So thank you.